Welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us at this event. My name is Stephanie Dunn and I'm the Regional Director for the Royal College of Nursing in the Northwest um, of England. I'm really pleased to introduce this event. It is the last of our Black History Month events in, in across England and across the, the other countries. And it is a, an event that's been developed um, for this, this particular period in partnership with the RCN Nurses and Management and Leadership Forum and the Library and Archive Service. This year, in 2020, the theme has been, across England, has been Power, Voice and Influence, our Black History Month theme. And it's really, throughout this month, we've been recognising that Black and minority ethnic nurses have a long and proud history of working in the UK and health and care system. This event is focusing very much on their lived experience during that time and for many it has been checkered and we are today exploring if and how the legacy is impacting on the BAME nurses experience today. Um, so to start with I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker who is Dr Claire Chatterton. Claire is a historian and lecturer in nursing at the Open University. And she will be talking to us about a history of black nurses in the UK. And I'll hand over to Claire. Thank you very much, Stephanie. It was a great pleasure to be asked to take part in this event. I'm just going to start sharing my screen so that you can see my slides. Hopefully they're up now on the screen for you. So to begin, I'm going to first of all talk about a nurse that until recently I hadn't heard about. But thanks to um, the work of the RCN archives, the story has started to be told. Her name was Sarah or Sarah Woodburn. And I've realised when I look now at the slide that I've actually added an H on it. It's actually S-A-R-A -A, Woodbine. And she arrived in the UK from Argentina at the age of 14. She worked in the linen room of the Western Fever Hospital and being very keen to become a nurse, was able to secure a training place at the Croydon Infirmary where she came first in her final examination. And then following her training, she became an assistant nurse in a fever hospital. The reason her story has become known is that it was featured in the Nursing Record and Hospital World Journal, which was later to become the British Journal of Nursing. And in October 1898, as you'll see, a plea for equality was made by the writer of the article about her. And in this article, they recounted her story, but they also recounted the problems that she was experiencing having qualified as a nurse at the top of her class in finding suitable employment, and not just in finding employment, but in also acquiring promotion. And in the letters page of the nursing record, there was initially an unpleasant response, and it could be argued that trolls, as we call them today, were that very much um, prevalent in the 19th century too, in a different guise. So first of all, on the left, on October the 15th, an unpleasant letter from someone who describes herself as an English girl, um, basically challenging um, the, the right of Sarah or Sarah to take up a post um, as a qualified nurse. But on the right, we can see two further letters that followed in the following week, on October the 22nd, 1898, by, by someone that called themselves an English sister and another that called themselves an English nurse. And in the, this time, it was very common for people to use pseudonyms when they wrote to nursing journals. Um, it was very rare for someone to use their real names. And I'll read the bottom one from an, the person that called themselves an English nurse. And she says to the editor of the nursing record, Dear Madam, it is with deep sorrow and great indignation that one reads the letter from an English girl in last week's issue of the nursing record. 
Should Miss Woodvine chance to see that letter, what would her feelings be towards her English sisters? We are proud to call ourselves a Christian nation. I'm afraid our Christianity does not go very far when one can express such unjust and unfeeling remarks as an English girl has done in that letter of hers. All honour and praise are due to Miss Woodbine, who has shown great courage and determination in coming to England to gain her certificate, that she may soon find some matron who will kindly take her and offer the, her the position she desires is the sincere wish of an English nurse. That small debate about Sarah Woodbine is a tantalising glimpse into a nurse working, a black nurse working in the 19th century. Sadly, it's been difficult to chart her story subsequently. We know that she eventually went to Sierra Leone to work as a nurse, and it may be that she wasn't able to find the promotion that she deserved or desired in England. Uh, we know from passenger lists through the through archival searches that she did come back to England and then return to Sierra Leone. But at the moment, nothing is known further of her, whether she stayed in Sierra Leone, whether she went back to Argentina, which is what she eventually aspired to do, or whether she came back to England. But I think her story is really interesting. It's the story of a nurse that isn't well known, but actually was trying to make her way in the world. And sometimes I think nurses can be forgotten um, from the 19th century when we're talking about black nursing. Another um, black nurse that is now becoming better known from the 19th century is Annie Brewster, sometimes known as Nurth Ophthalmic. She was born on the island of St Vincent in the Caribbean and moved to South London in the 1860s with her family as a, as a very small child. Her father was a wealthy merchant originally from Barbados. And in 1881, she became a trainee or what was then called a probationary nurse at the London Hospital and was appointed to the hospital's nursing staff on successful completion of her training in 1884. And she was promoted to nurse in charge of the Ophthalmic wards, hence her nickname, in 1888. Sadly, she was to die at the age of only, only 43 after an emergency operation in the hospital where she trained and worked and is buried in the City of London Cemetery in Newham in East London. On the 17th of November 2018, she was one of a number of figures whose photographs were projected onto the facade of the former Royal London Hospital building in Whitechapel to mark the 70th anniversary of the NHS. And it's a hospital where I trained, but I'm ashamed to say that until I think about a year ago, I had only, only recently have learnt about the story of Annie Brewster. This is a, a, the testimonial that Eva Lucas, the famous matron of the London Hospital, wrote about Annie Brewster. She said of her, she had spent the best and happiest years of her life at the London Hospital. She was with us for just over 20 years, nearly 14 of which have been spent as the nurse in charge of the ophthalmic wards. With her quick intelligence, she became very skillful in the treatment of eyes and her kindness to the poor old people who passed through her hands during this period was unwearied. Hospital friends mourn her loss and keep her in affectionate remembrance. I first heard her story thanks to historian Stephen Bourne, who came to speak to us at the Royal College of Nursing in London in a time when we were allowed to have face to face events. And Stephen talked about her and other black nurses whose lives that he's researched. And on the left, I've put his book, Walter Windrush, Black Women in Britain, 1939 to 1948. Um, but of course, he's also researched the lives of nurses before then. And we owe him a deep debt for raising the profile of Annie Brewster. I'm often asked the question as a nurse historian, who was the first black nurse to join the register? Because the Nursing Registration Act in 1919, or acts I should say, as they covered the whole of the UK, were the first time that nurses were recorded on a register um, and it was possible to say who, had, um, who were trained nurses because before 1919 in the UK, it was very blurry and there were very different standards of training. 
Unfortunately, the register does not record ethnic origins, so it's very difficult to tell who was the first black nurse to register. And this is um, a board that came from the um, exhibition that we did in the RCN Library and Heritage um, Centre. Um, and this tells the story of Eva Lowe. We know from the nursing register that she, nurses registered that she did register in 1935 in London. We also know that she was rejected many times before, before finding employment, receiving very vague and unsatisfactory excuses for her rejections. So although we don't know whether she was the first black woman to have her name on the nursing register, we do know that other hospitals, mostly in South London and in Birmingham, for example, were admitting black probationers or student nurses from at least the early 1930s. So we don't have a definitive answer to that question, but it's, I think it's important to remember these early pioneering nurses and also the struggles that they faced, uh, which is an ongoing theme throughout the stories that I'll be telling in this short time. I also wanted to uh, talk about the work of a, a very exciting project called A Hidden History, African Women and the British Health Service, 1930 to 2000. And I was lucky enough to go to an online lecture given by two very young, inspiring black historians, Nisha and Jasmine, from this project on Monday through the auspices of the University of Kent. And I've put the website address there and it's well worth having a look um, at the work that they're doing to raise um, and research and raise the profile of the stories of African women who came and worked in the British Health Service um, in this period and they too um, in their in their um, video and, and web searches and archival work have also highlighted the story of Annie Brewster who came before 1930 um, but um, again is someone that they've they've highlighted um, as part of their work. This is just one example of one of the nurses that they're researching, um, a princess who came from Nigeria, Princess Adamola, um, for whom the colonial office made a film, uh, Nurse Adamola, and this on the right is a still from the film. On the left, you can see um, a poster from the uh, Young Historians Project wanting to find out more information and to tell her story in more detail. And again, I've put the, the link there for, the, for a very good blog from the National Archive talking about the archival material that's available but also all the gaps that are not available when we try to tell different nurses stories. Another um, nurse that's um, not very well known it could be argued is this nurse who was the daughter of Emperor Haile Selassie of Abyssinia, today's Ethiopia, born in 1919, trained and worked as a nurse at Great Ormond Street Hospital in the late 1930s, having had to flee to England following the Italian invasion of her country. Her father was restored to the throne in 1941 and she returned to Ethiopia, but sadly died at the age of only 22 in childbirth in 1942. But here she is working at Great Ormond Street Hospital, where she trained as a sick children's nurse. I'm going through the history of black nurses in the UK at an incredible pace because I only have a very short period of time and I'm very conscious that there's a very, very rich history. But what I'm trying to do through these stories is raise the profile of, of black nurses, which is something that has been happening over the last few years, but something that definitely needs to continue to happen. An excellent documentary that was shown on BBC Four and which is still available on BBC iPlayer is this documentary, Black Nurses, the Women Who Saved the NHS. And in this, we hear from over 18 nurses and midwives who came to the UK from what we now would call the Windrush generation that came after the inception of the NHS in the UK in 1948, often in response to advertisements from the British government who were desperately needing nurses to come and work in the fledgling NHS as there was a crisis of recruitment um, which continued in some of the specialities throughout the 1940s, 50s and 60s and shortages of nursing is a common theme in nursing history. 
on the on the front there we can see one of the nurses from the project Lynette and there are more nurses that I've just highlighted here but I wasn't able to get all 18 on the screen but their stories are fascinating and and need to be told um, but again, when we listen to the stories of the nurses who have come from overseas to work in the NHS and also nurses who are second and third generation, um, we, we can see and hear themes that are ongoing, which I will pick up again um, in a minute. But I'm also conscious that many of these um, pictures and stories are of women nurses and, of course, male nurses, too, um, from overseas and from um, the black British population have given Im an immense amount to nursing. This is one nurse that um, we have, re have a recording of in the RCN archives, Steve Kimata, who came from Kenya to work in the British National Health Service. And he says, and this is a quote from his oral history interview, I was amazed to see trees didn't have any leaves because I thought, oh my God, I thought they were all dead. But obviously I was told it was winter. I had never seen snow on the ground apart from the top of Mount Kenya when I was a boy and Mount Kilimanjaro. We lived near a place where you could see both mountains. There wasn't a single Kenyan in the hospital. I was the only Kenyan, although there were people from the West Indies, Dominican Republic, but I didn't know where that was until afterwards. This is my colleague and friend Patrick Santos, who I worked with for many years at the University of Brighton, who came from Mauritius to train as a mental health nurse um, and has recently retired, having had an illustrious career in nurse um, education, um, teaching nurse leadership and being a nurse leader himself. He's recently retired and has again told his story and again highlights the nurses that came from Mauritius to work in the NHS. And here's a member of RCN staff until relatively recently, Benel Basu, the regional director for London. And here he is with some of the nurses from and members of the Royal College of Nursing History of Nursing Society, of which he is a member and a great supporter. So I feel it's important to also acknowledge the contribution of black male nurses as well um, in this very, very brief overview and, and run through black nursing history in the UK. But when we look at the narratives of individual nurses and the research and the oral histories that have been done, there are themes that run, I think, throughout from the early nurses working in the Victorian era through the 1930s into the Windrush generation and into the present day. And of course, Yvonne Coghill will be picking up on these themes soon. Um, but one of the things that I think is important to highlight is the impact of racism, of prejudice and on, of discrimination on nurses' lives, black nurses' lives. And there's been a lot of, lot of talk in the literature about the colour bar, something that isn't defined in law, but is an example of a discriminatory practice. And here from the 1930s, there is an example from the Keys, which was the official organ of the League of what was then called Coloured Peoples, where the Manchester hospitals um, were in a communication um, with uh, as the president of the of the, um, of the, of the League. Um, and you can see there that there was a matron's letter. Uh, the matron was Lucy Duff Grant um, saying quite categorically, we have never taken coloured nurses for training here. And that was in 1937. And then the, a letter from the chair of the board saying that although the question of admitting coloured nurses was discussed in 1932, no decision had been recorded. Therefore, no rule against the admission of coloured women for training as nurses at the Manchester Royal Infirmary um, had been taken and each individual application will be considered on its merits. But it seemed quite clear that even though black nurses may have applied for training, they were not able to be admitted at that time. And that was a common theme in employment and a very um, overt example of discrimination. The historian David Olugsoga in his um, very interesting documentary series, Black and British, a, forgiven, a forgotten, forgotten History, also highlights the experience of nurses working and coming to work in the NHS. And on the left there, you can see some of the participants in his interviews for, for the series. 
One of them, Jeanette Creese, um, talks movingly about her experiences of direct racism that she received from patients. And this is a very, very common theme in oral history interviews. When I was in my second year, she said, and sorry, my, my picture's obscuring my slide there. I'll just have to, uh, I'll read it out to you. When I was in my second year and this patient said, when I was going to wash her, she said, take your black hand off me. And she said it with such venom that I just rushed to the toilet and cried. But that was so hurtful. I found it extremely upsetting. And that is a very, very common theme, sadly, in oral history interviews of black nurses in the UK. Jean Gay, who was interviewed on the Black Nurses documentary, a psychiatric nurse, told a very um, distressing story of how she was attacked by a group of what were then known as teddy boys. About 10 of them, she said, they knocked the fish and chips out of my hand. I remember being pushed and kicked and so on. I decided to ignore the blows. I was kicked in places I didn't know I possessed, even though it was all those years ago. I can still visualize it. It's quite horrible. Other themes that come out of oral history interviews and archival material about the experiences of black nurses in the UK also talk about the lack of promotion prospects, um, the feeling that nurses, black nurses were sort of channeled into unpopular specialities. And that was highlighted in a study in 2014, the snowy white peaks of the NHS, which looked at discrimination in governance and leadership and the potential impact on patient care. Mick Carpenter, who was um, the official historian of COSI, um, which was the precursor to Unison um, and now the Union, um, sorry, the Union Unison, um, he talked about um, his work looking at the history of that union, which recruited many black nurses. And he argued in his history of COSI working for health in 1988, that the role of the black nurse was, and I quote, to fill the most unpopular spaces in the labour force, the low paid, low status and low opportunity areas that were shunned by others. The hospitals where overseas staff were concentrated tended to be the less glamorous, dealing with more run of the mill illnesses, caring for the elderly and the physically ill and mentally impaired. And in 1961, he found a survey in the Oxford region found clear disparities between the proportion of nursing students in teaching hospitals, 3% were non-European, and non-teaching hospitals where the percentage was much higher at 21%. And in 1965, this issue was debated in Parliament and speakers raised the question of whether this was overt discrimination. It was cited that nationally only one to two percent of students in teaching hospitals came from a non-European background. Another theme that has emerged many times as well in oral history and, uh, and written narratives about nurses' experience is about this issue of whether they were guided into the, what was the, should have been the right kind of training for them. And Dame Donna Kinnair, our Chief Executive and General Secretary, uh, was quoted saying this in The Guardian in June of this year. She said, I started my training in 1983 at the Royal London Hospital when my son was six months old. My sister had applied to do nursing at that same hospital a year before me. When she went for her interview, they tried to persuade her to train as a state enrolled nurse, which is a lower grade than a registered general nurse. She told me, watch out, they'll try to push you into a lower grade. She was right. In my interview, they started saying it was, would be better for me to be a state enrolled nurse. I said, no, thank you, not with my qualifications. And if you don't want me, I've got an interview at Bart's down the road. That was my first experience of racism in the NHS. That was in the early 1980s. But in fact, in the mid 1960s, this issue was raised in the nursing press. And although for some nurses, doing their enrolled nurse training, a two year training in the UK, may have been the right decision for them. Many nurses did not make an informed decision. And there, was, there is many, many um, 
amounts of large amounts of evidence that suggests that many of them went into a state enrolled nurse training where they were then unable to get promotion and unable to achieve the, the status that they deserved. So I'm going to end my talk now because I'm very conscious that um, I've only got 15 minutes and as I say it's an incredible whistle-stop tour through history and I'm conscious that I haven't mentioned Mary Seacole. I haven't forgotten her but I'm, I wanted to tell some of the may, maybe the more unknown stories because now Mary Seacole's story is widely known um, hopefully um, as part of British history and of black British history. But I think it's really important that the themes that I've highlighted, which come through again and again in the historical narrative, um, are highlighted. Because although there are lovely pictures of nurses happy together, like the one on the right, which my friend gave me of her time training as a mental health nurse at Claybury Hospital in Essex in the 1960s, there are, there are also stories of unhappiness and of misery and of discrimination. And it's important to remember that. So as we celebrate and, and thank the black nurses of our, of our country for all that they have given to healthcare services, it's also important to remember the problems that still remain today. So I will hand over now to Yvonne Coghill, who will take us up to the present day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claire. That was really informative and um, you know, could sit and listen to much more from you. And thank you, Yvonne. Yvonne Coghill is CBE, has been the director of the NHS Workforce Race Equality Standard, the RES, since 2015. And I'm delighted to introduce her to talk about nursing, to us about nursing whilst black. Is history still with us? Yvonne, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Stephanie, and thank you, um, Claire. Um, I was actually wasn't going to show some slides, but whilst I was listening to Claire, I thought, do you know what? I think I need to show at least a couple, uh, and I've pulled a couple of slides up because what Claire was talking about in terms of our history as black nurses is as pertinent today as it was um, I suppose that the, uh, from the dawn of time, which is that as black nurses, we are discriminated against, we are reviled, and there are um, elements still in our NHS uh, that don't want us here. And so I think we really, really need to start, start thinking about that. And I was going to start uh, my story back in 1948, when black and ethnic minority, uh, a huge number of black and ethnic minority people came into this country or asked to come into this country. And of course, many of you will know the wonderful poem by um, Professor Laura Sarant called, You Called, We Came. And indeed, many, many, many people from the Caribbean came to this country to help build up the NHS after the war. And as Claire said, many were invited to do uh, nurse training, but not SRN training as it was then uh, known, but SEN training was, which was the two year program at the time. So I think it's really important that we remember those nurses and actually remember the nurses that came before that, because it was really interesting to hear the story of several of the nurses who experienced discrimination um, when they were actually just trying to do their job and what was really what's really fascinating and interesting is how how pervasive and how deep rooted that discrimination is and I, I do several talks I talk to lots of people about about race equality as that was one of my uh, that was one of the jobs that I, I did uh, in my 43 year career in the NHS and I, I think that, you know, this thing called discrimination or racism or whatever you want to call it, is something that I would say is probably the most successful initiative the world has ever put into place. Because it is self-sustaining and it has been self-sustaining for the last 400 years, where people believe that there is a hierarchy in terms of what good looks like and what good doesn't look like. And nurses, nurses, we get caught up in, in all of that. 
And um, just to show you, and I will share share this uh, very quickly if I can find it on my computer, which I cannot at the moment, unfortunately. Um, I tried to pull it up before, and um, it was there, but it's just sometimes it does it just doesn't materialize, and it's not coming up on the screen. So I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to share that with you. Um, no, it's gone. But what I was going to show you was how black and ethnic minority nurses today uh, in 2020 are saying that their experience uh, is, is not very good at all. And we know that we have 20% uh, of our workforce are from um, non-white backgrounds and indeed the NHS could not function without uh, nurses from all over the world. Uh, and we're constantly recruiting nurses from all over the world to come and work in our NHS. And I was talking last night to a group of nurses from, from Canada, and they were saying exactly the same thing. And I talked to nurses in America, and the thing that we experience here as black nurses is still very present. So what I was going to talk to you about was my own personal story and how I started my nurse training back in 1977. And I think at the time, and that was 43 years ago, I didn't recognize or realize that uh, discrimination and racism was in, in the, the health service. I wanted to be a nurse and that's all there was to it. And when I was rejected for uh, to do my nurse training from Guys and Tommies and Barts in the London, um, I didn't for one minute think it was anything to do with uh, the color of my skin. I just thought, well, you know what, I didn't get in. And I was very lucky to get into do my nurse training at Central Middlesex Hospital. And at that time, there were a lot of nurses from the Caribbean um, working at Central Middlesex Hospital. And we had nurses there who were nursing officers, clinical leads and so on. And in fact, our um, nurse tutor, the lead nurse tutor at the time, was a chap called Mr. Adigan, who I suspect some of you will have heard uh, Elizabeth and Ionwu talk about, because he was actually the, um, the, the, the chief or the lead tutor in the school of nursing back then. And I have to say my career as a, uh, a black nurse in the NHS actually was, was fine, I thought. I didn't have any problems or difficulties or issues until I wanted to become a director of nursing. It was when I wanted to become a director of nursing um, that I found that despite applying for lots of jobs, it wasn't possible for me to become um, a director of nursing. And in fact, to this day, it is a, 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 to my regret that I have never been a director of nursing in the NHS, um, simply because after five attempts to become a director of nursing, I gave up. And at the time, I didn't realize that it was anything to do with, with me, uh, per se. I thought it was, no, I didn't think it was anything to do with the system, I beg your pardon. I actually thought it was to do with me. And I was constantly told that, you know, somebody else was better than you on the day, uh, and this is what you need to do. And I went off and I got my first degree, my second degree, a third degree. Um, but still, I wasn't good enough to become a director in the NHS. And what that did to me was make me incredibly angry um, and resentful and depressed and unhappy. And I just wanted to leave the service because it didn't want me. And I just felt, you know, it doesn't want me and I am not going to uh, stay around. What I didn't know at that time was that this was happening to hundreds, uh, if not thousands of other black and ethnic minority nurses because today in 2020, we, we still have the majority of our nurses uh, of color at band five and a few more at band six. And then it actually gets uh, it's like a ski slope. It goes down and down and down until you get to VSM, where there are now only 15 chief nurses from uh, black and ethnic minority backgrounds in our NHS. So, uh, but at the time I wasn't aware of that. And I think that, that, I think for lots of us who are working in our silos, we don't understand or know how it, how it feels um, for the rest of, uh, of the, of the service. So, 
after that, I, I became, um, as I say, sour, bitter and very, very twisted. And I was uh, lucky to be picked up by the then chief executive of the NHS, Nigel Crisp, Lord Crisp as is, and eventually worked with Christine Beasley, who was the chief nursing officer at the time. And I was fortunate enough to be able to get to where I wanted to go, but not in a nursing role. Um, I became the director of workforce race equality, uh, which was taking a sideways step, but also always having nursing and nurses, nurses and nursing at the back of my mind. And I think that, you know, talking about the past and how it was in the past and how, you know, 15 years ago, we only had you know, 12 executive directors of nursing from uh, from from. Um, non-white backgrounds and today having 15 we can see how slowly things are changing and it's what I said earlier about how this uh, thing called racism and discrimination is so pervasive and so deep-rooted and it's very 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 difficult to actually root it out and for society to become the equitable um, society that we all say we all say we want it to be and if we all said we want it to be uh, you know, a fair and equitable society. The question people have to ask themselves is why it isn't, why it isn't like that. So my story is quite a bit one because as I say, I took a sideways step. I think the interesting thing now about, about nurses and nursing, particularly, we are in a situation where we have thousands of nursing vacancies, for nearly 45,000 nursing vacancies. We're in the middle of a pandemic um, and our black and ethnic minority nurses are nurses of, of who are not from white backgrounds are at the forefront of the fight against the pandemic. And that's because most of them are at the coal face. Most of them are uh, in jobs where they have to uh, work directly with patients. And obviously, as a consequence of that, they are going to be um, facing the viral load much more than other nurses. And as a consequence of that, we know that we've had a disproportionate number of our um, non-white nurses um, succumbing to the virus and actually dying. And I'm not sure that people have made the link uh, as, as, as firmly as they should about why that is and how discrimination comes into some of that. Uh, there was an epidemiologist last week who put out a report saying that uh, he doesn't think that race is an issue. We should focus on housing and uh, and uh, uh, other issues. The fact is that people are in poorer housing as a consequence of their ethnicity. People have poor education as a consequence of their ethnicity and people are um, ill as a consequence of their ethnicity because as um, people who are constantly subjected to discrimination, it compromises your physiology, not just your mental health, but your physical health. And we know that age doesn't just capture the length of time you've been alive, but it captures uh, as well the experiences you've had in that time. And that causes you to age faster than your white counterparts and for your body not to be as robust. And we have so much evidence that shows that that is the case. So, you know, that is something that we are dealing with today. And, and I, I believe that nurses are, and I do believe this, are the most professional and wonderful group of people that there are because day after day, they will still put themselves in harm's way to actually look after their patients. The country recognizes that, and you know, we used to come out and clap every Thursday night. We are the most trusted profession and our voices are being heard in some quarters, but actually there's a lot of, um, I think, room for skepticism. And we have to be honest about that because we know that, that nurses still aren't aren't paid what they should be paid. And nurses of color are paid even less um, because they're sitting at the lower levels of the uh, service in band fives and they sit in those jobs for much longer. When it comes to their retirement, they obviously are going to get lower levels of pension. So all of this matters for people from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds in terms of how they are viewed and how they're treated. And it seems to me that that treatment hasn't changed very much. It's different, 
to being called all sorts of names and that awful story about that poor woman being being beaten up and kicked and her fish and chips thrown all over the place and you know saying you know get your black hands off me and all of that it's changed but actually the impact of how it manifests itself is is very much the same and i think it's really important that we as nurses all nurses from all backgrounds yeah. support each other in making sure that that discrimination does not happen and i think that that is something that we are not particularly good at and we have to start to become better at that because the nmc data shows very clearly that the people that refer um, their colleagues to the NMC or people, nurses to the NMC, and these nurses are disproportionately from non-white backgrounds, happen to be their fellow nurses and colleagues, as opposed to it being patients. So that's something that we really need to think about and something that we have to think uh, about how we actually manage that and what we actually do. I mean, to the future. And I think that, you know, we were talking about the past and how it's been and, and how it was for me and how it has been for thousands of other nurses, you know, of colour across our NHS who work tirelessly to make sure that nursing, nurses uh, and, and uh, I beg your pardon, that patients get a very high quality service. Uh, what we know for a fact is that nurses are clever. You cannot, you cannot dispute that. All nurses are clever. And, you know, to pass your exams and to work hard and to to make things better for patients is what we all do as nurses and it is what nurses of color strive to do and I have met some phenomenal student nurses and newly qualified nurses from all backgrounds who really want to make a difference and I look at these nurses and I think to myself how wonderful they are and how different the training is now to what it was when I first trained as a nurse. So the positive things that there were when I was was training was the camaraderie and being together with other nurses of colour in nurses, nursing homes. I think today it is very, very different. And nurses are much more likely to be researchers and educationalists and much more about finding out about what is best for patients and how we can make things better. It is, it's a very, very different way of behaving and being and I think it's absolutely wonderful. We are well respected, we are well liked, we need to be well paid, we need situations and systems to actively promote the quality of nurses that we have from black, uh, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds. It isn't, it isn't right and it isn't fair that so few of us manage to make it to the most senior levels in the NHS. And there's something that the RCN needs to do about raising the profile of that uh, disparity um, and, and the, the unfairness of that and how that impacts on black, Asian and minority ethnic staff. We also know that the more melanin you have in your skin, the darker you are in our NHS, the more this, this, this insidious and horrible thing impacts on you and your career. We have uh, documentation and evidence to show that that's exactly the case. And that if you are a nurse or midwife from, from Africa and particularly Nigeria, your experiences are going to be so much worse than if you come from China or even from India. We need to change all of that and start to make things different and better across the board for all of our nurses, because every single one of them is valuable invaluable, appreciated uh, by our public. We know that uh, in, in lots of ways and not appreciated in others. And what we have to do as nurses is to, to own each other and support each other and raise our voices for each other, um, as opposed to sometimes some people not, um, not recognizing or doing that. And I think going forward after this uh, Black History Month and into the wave, wave two of this pandemic, my hope and my wish is that as nurses, our voices are, are, are raised for all nurses, that we support our colleagues to make sure that they are safe, that they have adequate protection, that they are considered um, when there, is, uh, there are issues around who is going to be at the forefront 
and who is not going to be uh, at the forefront of, of the pandemic and the virus. So for me, uh, nursing is, is, is and has been the best career of, of my life. I have never known anything else. My regret is that I have never been a director of nursing, but for two years, I have been the deputy president of the Royal College of Nursing. So from that perspective, uh, that, that makes up for it. But I would say to all of you uh, on the call, whether you're from a black, Asian or minority ethnic background, or whether you're from a white background, own how fantastic and fabulous you are as a nurse. It is a wonderful, wonderful thing to be called a registered nurse or a nurse assistant or a, a, a healthcare assistant or an associate nurse, anything that is looking after and caring for our population uh, with a nurse handle on it is a wonderful thing for people to be. And I hope at the end of uh, Black History Month, we can actually sit back and say to ourselves, as people of color, we have supported and helped our NHS to be the very best that it could be. And going forward, we will continue to do that with the help and support of our white allies. So thank you very much. Yvonne, thank you so much. That was really powerful. And I think, you know, difficult listening and it really just dovetailed very well with Claire's, Claire's history. So clearly history is still with us. So thank you for sharing that. Very well. Uh, I think it has been for me a really powerful event. Um, lots of learning, I think lots of challenges um, thrown down by both Claire and Yvonne. And I think, you know, as individuals and as an organization, we have to rise to those challenges and we have to accept individual and collective responsibility for some of those changes. It's not enough to stand by and watch what's going on no room for bystanders we actually need upstanders and people being allies like you say and if we're going to use those stories they have to be there to illustrate why change needs to happen and how change needs to happen um so i just want to thank you both mm -hmm. for for spending time with us sharing your knowledge and experience it's been powerful mm -hmm. i think that the audience that we've had i want to thank you for joining us